And joining us now, Dr. Glenn Tonzer, uh, a ag economist, a beef livestock economist, actually kind of a specialist at K-State. And uh, we wanted to bring him back as uh, a few weeks ago, we kind of talked as we were learning more. Now we even know more. And uh, Dr. Tonzer, you have, uh, you and your colleagues have done uh, a lot of uh, analysis on uh, the impact that COVID-19 has had on the protein sector. Uh, uh, what were some of your findings, at least as, as we know it right now? Yeah, and I'll start very broad in answering that question. And we can do a deep dive into specific versions on the kind of the back end of this. But I think it's important to do a quick timeline of the major shocks that drives these impacts, and then we can get into the numbers. Uh, it seems like a long time ago for most of us, but I'll remind us the first shock was in the month of March. We started shutting down states. So that's when the stay at home type orders across the country at different points of time came in place. The relevance of that for the protein space was we had a big shift in our food consumption patterns. So we started consuming our food largely at home. So demand for food through grocery stores and a retail channel was boosted. Meanwhile, demand for food through restaurants and food service declined. In the protein space, that's really important because not all beef, not all pork, not all chicken is equal. Uh, we don't send each product equally through the different market channels. I use high-end steak as an example that's more prevalent through uh, white tablecloths sit down restaurants as a percentage of the volume we normally consume. And conversely, ground beef is something that consumers are a little more comfortable preparing at home, personal ingredient. Uh, on the pork space, bacon, two-thirds of it normally is consumed in the food service channel, one-third at home. Those kind of not 50-50 realities threw a lot of shocks in the protein system just because we started staying at home. So that's largely the effects that occurred in March and the first half of April, let's say. But as April progressed, then the bottleneck in the industry developed. And this is where the general public took even greater note of the livestock and meat industry. And the bottleneck was our challenges in harvesting animals and converting them into edible meat products. So taking cattle and hogs, running them through processing and packing facilities, and producing a whole suite of beef and pork products became more of a challenge. Um, a number that gives real context to this was the last week of April. Both species were running about 40% below the same period the year earlier. So a real simple way to think about this is we were running about 60% of our desired capacity. And both industries entered the year with lots of animals. We entered into this whole story planning to produce a lot of protein. So a backlog of animals very quickly developed. Lots of discussion around euthanization, you know, backing them up in feedlots, lots of that commentary. And meanwhile, lots of commentary on the volume and variety mix of meat products that consumers had available was changing pretty quick. So through the month of May, the term of quote unquote shortage was floating around and I was doing my best to put context on the shortage can be misleading because there's no shortage of animals. Our ability to produce protein has been temporarily hit largely in the month of May. And we've had a lot of improvements since then. Uh, Time Magazine and the like took note of this just to give some context. You know, the general public took note of this. It was no longer just a livestock producer and you know, packer processor in inter interchain discussion, all of society took note of the changes that happened to our meat production system. Those are the two big shocks that happened, and they're not small shocks. Uh, each of them have major effects on the meat and livestock markets. And at the end of the day, just before we get buried in numbers, is those collectively depressed livestock prices and elevated wholesale meat prices. And we're still seeing higher retail prices follow after that, but we're already seeing lower wholesale prices, and I could break that down more if we need to, but some of the massive shocks that were already in play have worked their way through the marketplace for the most part in the wholesale meat place, and we're still seeing some of that ebb towards the consumer. Dr. Glenn Tonzer, K-State uh, Beef Ag Economist, is our guest. Let's take a break. We'll come back with more in just a moment. 